Um, so this is a forum sponsored by the Ukraine Socialist Solidarity Committee. If you found your way here, you've probably seen our Facebook page. If not, um, we have a Facebook page and it has our points of unity on it and a lot of other things. Um, in a few weeks, we're gonna be having another uh, speakers, speaker event like this one online that will be talking about the influence of fascist ideas in the left and how it's come to be that the majority of the left, especially the socialist left in the world is on the wrong side of history in regards to Ukraine. So um, there will be announcements about that. So if you're interested in that, um, you know, follow us on the Facebook page or sign up for the email list. Um, Simon is gonna speak for 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Um, during his remarks and in, during the discussion, um, feel free to use the chat box, but we do encourage people to not use it excessively because it is very distracting. Um, and especially if you have links to websites that you want to share, it would be much more helpful if you would put those on the Facebook page because then they will be saved. If you put them in the chat box and people don't capture them, then they'll be gone after the meeting is, is over. Um, so during the uh, discussion period, we're gonna try to limit um, each person's speaking to two or three minutes. Um, and hopefully if, you know, if there's time and interest, we can have a second round. Um, and of course, people can make comments. They can also ask questions for Simon and then he will, um, well, he can either answer questions directly or save them all until, until the end. I guess we can ask Simon what his preference is on that. Also, I don't, if, is everyone, if I hope everyone is familiar with how to use the raise your hand function. Um, it should be in your lower right-hand corner of your screen on the menu. Um, I will be actively looking for raised hands and the people who have their hands raised do come up to the top row in the gallery. Um, but if I don't see your hand raised, please you know, do something and um, collectively we'll make sure that you get to speak in the order in which people raise their hands. So. I think those are all my comments. Um, Ted, will you introduce Simon? Sure. Just one thing. In, in my version of Zoom on my screen, the raise your hand function is under reactions. It's just if you're looking for it. Okay, well, <clears throat> I don't know a lot more about Simon than it, we posted. Uh, I met Simon in 1987 in Buenos Aires. We were both passing through the Trotskyist movement uh, where I think he and I spent more or less the same period, amount of time at different times and places. And that occasion was in the Internationalist Workers League, Fourth International. Um, Simon told me he considers himself a Marxist bill, but not a Trotskyist, which I think is part of post-Trotskyism worldwide. He <clears throat> was the editor of the Mine Workers Union Journal in the 1990s in, in the United Kingdom. And he's the author of a number of books, um, The Russian Revolution and Retreat, 1920 to 24, which I would like to read. Unfortunately, it's a Rutledge label, and that's very expensive, uh, and it's not available in my local library, but I would really like to read it. That was a product of his PhD thesis. He also wrote Soviet <coughs> Workers in the New Communist Elite in 2008, uh, Change in Putin's Russia, Power and Power, Money and People, uh, he is an expert in uh, environmental issues, particularly issues related to natural gas. And he has written The Russian Gas Matrix. <clears throat> and is particularly he specializes in, as I understand it, the Ukrainian natural gas uh, network. And he has two, two blogs. One is Simon Perani at Blogspot, and another is 
People and Nature at WordPress, where he has written extensively about issues facing Ukraine, not just in the since the invasion this year, but for a long time. <clears throat> um, going back before the first Russian annexation of Crimea and the formation of the uh, so-called People's Republics in 2014. I, I ran into him more, in between 1987 and now, I ran into him when he was promoting a, a petition online uh, in defense of the uh, of Chechnya against the Russian aggression. And he was one of the few people on the left that I knew, I mean, I didn't know him at the time, who was on the side of the people of, che of Chechnya. And I have followed him off and on online since then. I think Simon is, an, is a very knowledgeable person about all of the issues related to this. And I'm very happy to see your face again, Simon, after 35 years. Yeah. You, you, you look okay. different. So go ahead, Simon. Well, uh, thank you, Ted. That was an incredibly uh, kind uh, introduction. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, and what I'm going to do, just to get this out of the way, I prepared, I hear what you say about putting them on the Facebook page, and I'll do that. But I prepared a load of links to put in the chat. And they're not. I'll put them in. I'll put them in after I finish talking. I I failed the first time round. And a, a quick tip for you, Ted, is that there's a, there's a magnificent um, website. Uh, maybe for people who aren't speaking to mute, and we'll get less feedback. Um, th there's a magnificent. Uh, website run by uh, some anarchists here in the UK called Libcom, L-I-B-C-O-M. And uh, the, although uh, I shouldn't say this, um, and I'm sure Routledge wouldn't be pleased to hear it, um, they've pirated a PDF copy of uh, my book, The Russian Revolution in Retreat, and you can pick it up there for nothing. Um, so uh, there we are. Uh, what I'm going to do, I, I, I can see in front of me a, a knowledgeable uh, audience. Uh, so I think probably, you know, what, what we can usefully do here is I'll speak about seven points that relate to the theme uh, I was asked to speak about. Um, and that, I'll tell you what they are, and then I'm going to run through them, and then, you know, we'll have more time for, for discussion. They are uh, Ukraine as Russia's oldest colony. Secondly, the character of the Maidan movement in 2014. Thirdly, what was going on in Southeast Ukraine before and during 2014. Fourthly, the, the Russian uh, occupation of Crimea and Donbass. Fifthly, a bit about the international context. And sixthly, the short-term causes of the new phase of the war. And seventh, uh, just a, 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 some thoughts about what the, the national question means uh, in the 21st century. Um, and uh, yeah, if you think I've left something out already, then uh, say so in the chat, I'll try and deal with it. Um, so I'm just gonna run through those points. Uh, the first about Ukraine being Russia's oldest colony, um, I think has to be borne in mind in order to understand what's happening now. Um, 19th century under the Russian Empire, restrictions on language, subordination to imperial institutions, uh, the form of land ownership uh, was uh, Russian dominated, uh, imperial institution that mattered most to many peasant families was uh, army conscription. So of course, huge numbers of Ukrainians in the Russian army that fell to pieces during the course of, 20, uh, of 1917. Um, in 1917, the declaration of the Ukrainian Republic preceded the Bolshevik seizure of power. So during 1917, in the, in the middle of 1917, I think it was June, um, a Ukrainian Republic was declared in defiance of uh, the Russian Empire, uh, or, or rather, well, the Russian Empire had gone, but in defiance of, of Russian imperial uh, traditions, which remained strong, 
This provoked a huge crisis in the provisional government in Russia. And this government for much of, exist of its existence was led by left social democrats. Nevertheless, the Bolsheviks had no hesitation in organizing to defeat it militarily and to encourage Russian speaking workers uh, who uh, were brought down to Eastern Ukraine in quite large numbers at that time with the start of the iron and steel industry uh, to encourage those Russian speaking workers to oppose the formation of the independent of independent Ukrainian institutions. Uh, I cannot recommend too highly uh, the book uh, by Marco Boyson uh, about the working class and the national question in the uh, revolution in the period from uh, the 1890s up until 1918. It's a magnificent piece of scholarship uh, by a Marxist of our generation. I, I mean, unfortunately, I think that one is expensive and I don't know that any pirate PDFs are knocking about on the internet, but you know, if you're a member of a university library or whatever, it's really essential reading uh, to my mind. Um, now, the fact that Ukraine was Russia, the Russian empire's most important colony remains significant through uh, the Soviet period. And indeed, uh, Soviet policy in the 1920s was actually uh, very strongly in favor of uh, the Ukrainian language. Um, and uh, Ukrainian language was obligatory at levels of government in uh, Ukraine. Uh, there were uh, arguments which were never resolved about the extent of independence that the Ukrainian Republic would be allowed uh, within the Soviet Union. But there was an understanding of national rights, which included that language law, which I, I think it'd be really interesting to compare that to the language law of 2018, which is being denounced by every uh, Stalinist and Putinist under the sun. I think in many respects, the one in 1920s was a little uh, stronger. And uh, I, I know that, uh, for example, to work in uh, any uh, government position, you had to take a Ukrainian language test and it was a written test and people would come and check on you. Um, so there was a real, uh, there was a real uh, fight on that. And uh, the, uh, that policy was reversed uh, in the mid 1930s. And at the end of the USSR, um, we should recall that uh, following the big miners strikes of uh, 1989 and 1990, there was then again a resurgence of national and nationalist movements in many of the uh, Soviet republics and none more so than Ukraine. They had this huge human chain across the whole country. Um, and uh, this was certainly fundamental in uh, leading to the end of the USSR. So disentangling these national and class questions has never been simple. And uh, I suppose for reasons I'll say in the, in the last bit of what I talk about, I mean, I, I for many years thought that, uh, you know, the national question in many ways was receding from importance in the 21st century. And I must say the events of the last few months have made me uh, rethink that. Okay, so going on to the second point, which is the character of the Maidan uprising in 2014. Um, the Maidan uprising was preceded, of course, by the uh, Orange Revolution of 2004. And broadly speaking, this was a movement uh, in support of democratic rights. Specifically, it concerned the organized rigging of the presidential election. So if we think back to that time, Ukraine had developed a system of financial industrial groups based on property taken out of or partly out of state ownership and led by oligarchs, politically influential businessmen. That's what I mean by that term. Um, Yanukovych, uh, who was a candidate in that election, Viktor Yanukovych represented some of the strongest of these groups based in the east of the country where the industrial base was. That's the iron, steel, coal, metals processing, chemicals, and so on. Now, there's no direct um, correlation between, um, there's no direct correlation between uh, one particular section of industry and 
uh, a group of oligarchs and the political parties. But in general, it's true that it was those Eastern groups that Yanukovych uh, represented, whereas his opponent, Viktor Yushchenko, was typical of Western leaning uh, bourgeois liberals uh, in post Soviet countries. Um, the cause of the Orange Revolution was that people uh, thought that, or the immediate cause of the Orange Revolution in 2004 was people thought that uh, Yanukovych's people had tried to fix the vote, which was a common, uh, was a common procedure in uh, post-Soviet countries. And uh, the outcome was a second election uh, and Yushchenko was uh, declared uh, the winner. Now, um, there were issues of free speech. Uh, there were issues, social issues that played into this as well. And there was the issue which became much bigger in 2014 of the orientation towards Europe. Many working class Ukrainians supported this uh, orientation. I'm a bit sick of reading in uh, Western uh, left-wing uh, papers about how this was just a matter of uh, the Ukrainian bourgeoisie. I think that's an oversimplification. And the reason was that millions and millions of Ukrainians were working in Western Europe by this time. There was huge migration. I mean, I remember on the, uh, the when the Orange Revolution broke out in 2004, uh, I happened to be visiting uh, my daughter who was studying in Madrid. And we got on the Metro Madrid and there were all these people dressed in Ukrainian colors, uh, orange colors, going to a demonstration at the Ukrainian embassy. And I just went up and uh, chatted to them. And I mean, what really struck me, um, and I'm going to throw these vignettes at you. So I'm not building a whole theory on a conversation in the Metro, but I just kind of think this was interesting. What was interesting was, you know, they were not your typical East European migrants who are young and single, right? They were families and they were on a family outing in their orange colors and off they were going to the embassy. And the significance of that is families, that means you've moved there for quite a, quite a time. It's a, it's a different type of, of migration. So, and I think that, uh, you know, that shared belief that working in Europe was a better deal for working class Ukrainians than working at home in Ukraine uh, was, uh, in the background of these uh, events. Now, of course, there was tension uh, rising There's, between the Ukrainian uh, bourgeoisie and the Russian bourgeoisie um, at this period. The Putin regime intensely disliked the Orange Revolution of 2004. It disliked uh, Ukraine's turn towards Europe. And um, uh, Ted, kindly mentioned my, I, I worked for quite a while, uh, 15 years at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies following uh, the gas sector in uh, Russia and Ukraine. And they had the so-called gas wars, which dated from this time when Russia wanted to take majority ownership of the Ukrainian pipeline system and came pretty close to doing that several times. Once. Uh, together with Shell, the oil company, uh, and other times different versions. They did that successfully in Belarus, uh, which is significant. Um, they were never able to do it in Ukraine, and it, it got right to the point of a law being put to the Ukrainian parliament, and at the last minute the Ukrainian parliament changed its mind, and this became an increasing source of friction. Um, that's a big trade for Russia, as, as we now, this has come out and been discussed a lot this year, I'm sure you're all aware of it. That's a big trade for Russia, and uh, having to transport the gas through Ukraine uh, reduced uh, Russia's room for manoeuvre, uh, both economically and politically. And uh, the, the, it's a long story about how they tried desperately to get control over that pipeline system, and that was always uh, a bridge that the Ukrainian uh, bourgeoisie and the Ukrainian government would not cross. Um, now, uh, if we then, uh, so if we go on from, so 2004 was the uh, Orange Revolution. Don't forget that in 2010, there was a further presidential election when uh, Yanukovych, the representative, as I'm arguing, of the Eastern oligarchs, was elected um, it, it, without apparently much 
um, fooling about with the uh, polls, uh, was elected and th that election was accepted all round as being legitimate as the president. Uh, so uh, from 2010, uh, he was the president. And of course, he was presiding over uh, a, an economic disaster for Ukraine that arose from the 2008-09 uh, crisis. Living standards, which have been very low in the 1990s, lower in most respects than in Russia, um, and better in the 2000s, the steel industry recovered, agricultural exports recovered, and uh, much of this crashed again. Um, and uh, the discussion about the move towards Europe took place under Yanukovych's presidency, and in fact the trigger for the Maidan uh, uprising, I would call it, I mean it depends how you count, but there were two triggers in a way. The first was that Yanukovych's people had negotiated an association agreement with the EU. The Russians didn't like it. They had tried to stop it um, and uh, did, did stop it at the last minute by effectively making Yanukovych's people a better cash offer in terms of the uh, interstate uh, relationship. Um, and, uh, but this, and students went out and demonstrated nothing unusual there. The second trigger that turned that into a really mass movement was the police going out and beating the hell out of these students. Uh, that was what really turned it from simply a protest uh, on this Europe issue to a much broader uh, uprising, which eventually uh, brought uh, Yanukovych down. So I, I suppose the conclusion there is to argue, and the, because this comes up again and again in the arguments about the character of the current war and the character of the Ukrainian uh, government, um, is uh, what, I, what I want to say is that there were all sorts of social issues feeding into uh, the uh, uprising in 2014. Now, I, and, uh, I'll just make this point, uh, Lisa, but, but I see you have your hand up, but let me just uh, make this point that when that uprising takes on this mass form, it does involve not only a huge proportion of the population, but also um, you know, a, a, a huge range of political forces from our friends in the socialist, uh, radical socialist and anarchist organizations through to the fascists. And there's no doubt in my mind that it was the fascists and the ultranationalists who were the best organized and the best armed uh, during that uh, uprising, uh, the so-called Maidan uh, revolution. Um, they used the occasion to get arms. The, the, don't forget that the, the, the authority of the police collapsed across the country. So uh, this was an opportunity for people and the fascists were most organized about it to get their hands on guns in many different uh, locations outside of Kiev as well as in Kiev itself. Um, nevertheless, uh, the uh, stuff about it being a so-called fascist coup, which we hear from people in the Stop the War Coalition here, and you no doubt hear it uh, over that side of the Atlantic, is, I mean, apart from, you know, the political point to it from their point of view, they're trying to uh, prove a political point about uh, Ukraine being uh, everlastingly fascist. But from an analytical point of view, it's just stupid. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and even, even the Kremlin, of course, didn't, wasn't using that terminology in, in 2014, as far as I know. Uh, do, Lisa, do you, want, do you want to ask a quick question or shall I keep going? Keep, keep, keep going, Simon. She'll okay. get your chance to speak after you're finished. Cool. Okay. So the third point is about um, uh, Southeast Ukraine in the period between uh, 2010 and, and 2014. Um, so at that time, uh, Yanukovych was the president and the party of regents, which was his party, was the largest party in parliament, well known for its incredible uh, corruption. Um, and I, 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 I mean, I'm using that word in the sense of a model of capitalism whereby political influence enables you to access uh, extraordinary uh, revenues, which can be creamed off from the economy in certain ways. I think the, in that sense, the, uh, it's a model similar to uh, the model that we saw in Russia at that time. Um, and 
uh, there's also no doubt that that party uh, had to some extent uh, support, at least in terms of votes, from working class people in uh, eastern Ukraine. Um, so, you know, you would read in the papers or hear on the television, you know, Donbass is subsidizing uh, the rest of Ukraine. Um, we're doing all the work. Uh, you guys are dining out on it and so on and so on. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that uh, working class people um, responded uh, to these arguments. And I think um, those arguments on the one hand and nervousness about uh, the increasingly strident tone of Ukrainian nationalism, on the other hand, uh, fed into uh, the mood uh, in southeast Ukraine uh, for you know in in 2014, and the support or um, support on the one hand and acceptance on the other hand of um, the right wing revolt by uh, elements in the party of regions. Uh, which was uh, fed in, which fed into uh, the separatist uh, movement. I think there's, again, these are subjects of huge controversy among uh, friends and comrades and uh, colleagues in Ukraine. Uh, my understanding, and you know, I, I, I'm not, a, I have to say, I'm not an expert researcher of Ukrainian social issues or political issues. I mean, obviously, I follow this stuff as closely as I can, and I travel was traveling until the pandemic regularly to Ukraine and Russia. But my understanding is that, you know, if you want to get down to the survey evidence, the survey evidence showed in 2014, um, strong support in Southeastern Ukraine for autonomy, different models of autonomy, and little support for separation. Um, and the, the of course, there are uh, separatist elements, and there's this. There are uh, the extreme Russian nationalists who are active there uh, at the time. Um, I, I mean, I, I would sum up the thing by saying that a conflict which was uh, a civil conflict um, turned into a military conflict uh, in 2014, primarily because of the military intervention of. Uh, Russian fascists and extreme nationalists uh, and uh, the Russian army. Uh, those are the forces that turned it into a military conflict. I think to, you know, to pretend that everything would have been fine if uh, they hadn't turned up is uh, an exaggeration. Uh, obviously, there was, you know, there, there, there were huge tensions there as a result of, of years of uh, this uh, the political playing on these themes by uh, Yanukovych and his allies. But I think what turns it into a military conflict very clearly is uh, the intervention of the Russian army and uh, these irregulars, uh, volunteer forces that fought alongside them. And if we think about the catalogue of events, so, I mean, the Crimea was annexed uh, very, very soon after the departure of Yanukovych. So, these huge demonstrations in Kiev, the collapse of the police force across the country leads to the uh, departure of Yanukovych. Uh, off he goes to Russia with his closest uh, people. I've just been reading this book, uh, which is a great journalistic account of the development of the offshore um, financial system by Oliver Bullo called Moneyland. I strongly recommend it. He, uh, He's a very good journalist, and he he starts with the example of Yanukovych's own personal wealth, which is which is pretty impressive. Um, and he sort of follows the money and uh, develops his argument there about the uh, the offshore and uh, the the financial uh, system. Um, right, moving on. So Crimea was annexed. Uh, there's an there's an immediate crackdown on all types of pro-Ukrainian and socialist activists there and the Crimean Tatars uh, and their organizations particularly. Um, and uh, that's followed by 
uh, the military conflict in Donetsk and Lugansk, which leads to the formation of these republics. Um, and I think the character of those regimes is very important. They are lawless client states of Russia. Uh, industry was trashed. Um, bits of it were taken into ownership by uh, corporations based in Ossetia, the also lawless uh, Russian supported enclave in Georgia. Um, all firm, forms of democracy, including um, workplace democracy, uh, were trashed. And I mean, there's a whole history there. We can we can talk about that some more. Um, uh, just a, a, a quick point about the, well, a couple of quick points about the politics of the government controlled part of Ukraine between 2014 and now. I mean, first of all, there's a concerted effort by the nationalists uh, to establish this sort of new national identity. There's a decommunization law similar to other Euro East European countries, um, which I think was passed in 2017. Um, and there's this language law, which was passed in uh, 2018. Uh, there are critiques of all this stuff, of course, by Ukrainian socialists, um, but I think these need to be distinguished from the stereotypes thrown around by the Kremlin uh, and those who, who repeat Kremlin uh, propaganda. Um, now, a quick uh, point about the international context. I think probably this audience is uh, aware of most of this, but, um, and it's again really, uh, I mean, one of the articles I'll put in the chat um, was written by me in response to uh, the stuff which we hear a lot about in uh, the so-called left in the West about uh, NATO expansion. So again, I mean, I think this needs to be tackled on two levels. I mean, first of all, there is an extent to which people are just recycling uh, whatever the Kremlin is saying. But I think obviously there has been NATO expansion. So I think we need to uh, analytically think about the way that that's happened and whether that can explain in any way uh, what's going on now. Um, my answer to the way that it happened is that you need to look at the economic relationship between Russia uh, and the Western powers. Uh, Russia was reduced during the 1990s to be a secondary power economically, a supplier of raw materials, and obviously uh, all kinds of cooperation, the offshore financial zone being a good example, were established between Western, the Western and Russian uh, ruling classes uh, as the economy emerged from the 1990s slump and on the basis of oil revenues and gas revenues and revenues from the sale of uh, minerals and metals, the Russian economy began to get back on its feet again. Now, the, the main chapter of NATO expansion started before that. Uh, 1999, they had a conference where a whole lot of states were kind of put on a membership, uh, whatever it's called, plan, and uh, 2004, all those states had joined, which included some of the Central European states, but also the Baltic states. Um, and uh, who, you know, they're not Mexico, right? The imperialist power they're worrying about is not over the border in the United States. They're in the Baltic States and therefore the imperialist power they're worrying about, which has invaded them at various times or, you know, received uh, ownership of them thanks to secret deals between Stalin and Hitler is Russia. So uh, you can see the logic uh, for the Baltic States. Um, the, uh, I mean, my understanding is that the, the, first of all, there was no membership action plan and never has been for Ukraine ever. I mean, obviously uh, NATO was anxious to build up a military relationship with Ukraine. It was doing that even uh, when Yanukovych was president, even before that. I mean, that's a long-standing thing, uh, but the weapon supply until the last year was absolutely negligible. Um, and the progress in terms of Ukraine moving towards membership was negligible. That was complicated by the European Union. U Ukraine desperately wanted EU membership, as did Turkey, and neither of those countries was ever going to be allowed to get anywhere near that by uh, Germany and France in particular. Um, 
And yes, it's true that the Western powers did not want a strong Russian state, but it's also true that the Western powers increasingly in this period from uh, 2000 onwards, when Putin is the president, uh, saw Russia as a gendarme, which they could use to maintain social control in the former Soviet territories. Uh, Chechnya's, Chechnya has been mentioned, Georgia, there's the Russian attack on Georgia in 2008, but I think primarily in Syria and Ukraine. And of course, the Russian intervention in Syria came after the war in Ukraine started in 2014, but it's very clear that the message from the Western powers were, was, you can support Bashar al-Assad, you can massacre as many Syrians as you like, uh, you can use chemical weapons, you can do everything else, but just keep away from the Western air bases in the Middle East and you will be fine. And, you know, much as they all deny that there is a, an arrangement with spheres of influence, that is a policy about spheres of influence. And the same was true actually with Ukraine, and it's notable that all the sanctions that were imposed on Russia after 2014 were imposed with respect to the annexation of Crimea, which was something that made the Western powers nervous and that they regarded as unacceptable. There were no sanctions related to the support for the uh, right-wing and fascist uh, elements that uh, were put in charge of these uh, so-called people's republics. Now, I'm going to be quick, and uh, Cheryl sent me a message uh, asking me very politely to be quick. And uh, I've got so two more bits to this. One is the short-term causes of the new phase of the war. I mean, the Minsk agreement was never going to work, right? I and mean, people who follow this more closely than I do, that's, that's their opinion. And I, having read into it, I mean, I'm sure they're right. You know, the, the agreement was that there would be a, a measure of autonomy um, and that Russian forces would withdraw. But it's not specified in so-called Minsk II which way around that's going to happen, right? So <laughs> it was never going to work and it didn't work. And uh, Taras Bilus actually, just when the, the current phase of the war started, wrote a very good article. Let's try and find that and, and share it, uh, he, he, he explaining uh, that as a uh, socialist comrade in Kiev. I think that's very, very worth reading. Um, and I, th I, think the, I think it's significant that during the last couple of years, I don't think, I, I, I mean, a lot of Ukrainians said to me, and uh, I'm, we're, when we're talking about very tragic and uh, difficult things now, a lot of Ukrainians said to me in, in the course of March, well, we always knew this was gonna happen. Not, not all. A lot of a lot of people said, oh, we, we never thought this was going to happen. But there were some people who said, oh, we always do this going to happen. Well, I can tell you now, I did not know it was going to happen. But I, I also don't think I don't think a lot of people in the Kremlin knew it was going to happen. I don't think this was a kind of pre. I think this was one possible option, which was obviously there for the Kremlin to take. And I think this is the way that the Kremlin operates, both in economic and in military terms, is that they keep their options open. I think Putin is extremely skilled in this respect. Um, they keep their option. I think this was always one option, but I don't think it was the favorite one. And I think there was much more concentration when all those Russian troops were gathering on the border. And, you know, the US, uh, uh, the CIA, to be fair to them, were saying it's going to be an invasion. Um, and I think at that point that the, 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 what was definitely going to happen was something with respect to the People's Republics. They were handing out huge numbers of passports, more than a million passports were given out in 2021 to citizens of the Republic so that they would be citizens of the Russian Federation. And that trick was played in Georgia, you know, well, we're just moving our peacekeepers in to protect our citizens, that's all. Um, and this was all going on. There were changes in the administration of those republics. There was a lot more direct Russian involvement in the administration. So all that was happening. Uh, but I think also that as a result of things that have happened in Russia, we have no time to speak about the protest movements, the failure of the Kremlin to deal with those, the, 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 the deteriorating condition of the economy uh, due to, you know, up until now, the low prices of oil that followed the 2015 crash, all sorts of other things. I think the Kremlin's domestic agenda was driving it more and more into a kind of ideological 
nationalism, uh, which was, you know, on speed, if you like. I mean, it's always been there, but it's been massively ratcheted up over the past year or so. Um, the much, much more extreme forms of repression domestically. And I think it's all that that plays into the decision then, which of course was a, a, a catastrophic, um, you know, there was a catastrophic from the Kremlin's point of view, underestimation of how Ukraine as a country would respond, but all that played into the decision to invade on the 24th of February. Now, I, I'm gonna finish just very quickly this seventh point about what the national question means in the 21st century. I mean, it's more to raise a question than to tell you what my answers, in because, answers are because I don't know what they are. Um, I had a, uh, for many years, I thought that the education, if you like, that I had had as a Marxist about uh, the, the issue of national liberation um, was wanting. And the reason I thought it was wanting more than anything was that I couldn't see any progressive role being played by the bourgeoisie in countries, whether uh, in Latin America or in Africa, um, or, uh, or, or whether, uh, you know, bureaucratic formations like in Vietnam, particularly, I spent a lot of time uh, looking at the uh, Vietnamese regime and, and the role, and I couldn't see any really socially progressive politics or anything to do with what I would think of socialism coming from these regime. So I thought that the part of the schema which was prevalent in the Marxist movement in the early 20th century about, uh, you know, the, 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 the not only that nations had a right to resist colonialism, but that there was a, a progressive aspect to that nationalism, I thought was wrong. And I still think it, I still think we've moved past that period of history. We're in the history, we're in the globalized form of capitalism. Uh, where empires uh, are neo-colonialist and economic rather than direct very often, but I don't see anything progressive um, inherently, you know, and I don't see very much progressive just, uh, you know, from the evidence before our eyes of any of these national uh, bourgeoisies that find themselves resisting colonialism. However, I mean, I think more than ever now, actually, as a result of the events of the last few months, I mean, I do think there is a right to resist, um, which is something that, you know, I would embrace uh, as part of my socialist understanding of the world. And that is not conditional and it's not kind of, um, uh, and, and it's not limited by the fact of, of whatever, uh, however I might see uh, the bourgeoisie in Ukraine or any other country. I mean, I think the, uh, you know, that right to resist is there for me as much in Ukraine as it is in uh, Palestine uh, or in Ireland, which is not a, a hot war, thank God, but I mean, that's something that's obviously concerned us all our lives, being involved with socialist politics in the UK. Um, I don't see there's any, and there's plenty of reactionary politics in Ireland and plenty in Palestine, but I don't see that that affects this right to resist. And that to me is a, is a political, um, you know, that's been a kind of political anchor for me over the past uh, few months. Um, what that says about outcomes and what that says about the, the course of the war is, a, is another subject really to what we're speaking about today. So I'll leave it there. Uh, and sorry for going on a bit long and thanks for listening. Oh, thank you very much, Simon. Um, so, uh, um, couple things. Three, three people have raised their hands. Lisa raised her hands during the presentation and then uh, Sismon, I hope I pronounced your name right, and then Virginia. Um, uh, before we start, I just want to remind everyone that if it, to, I encourage everyone to not use the chat box excessively. Um, and if you have links to share, please post them to uh, the Facebook page um, because otherwise they'll be lost because it's People won't be able to capture them necessarily during the meeting. John will timer for the discussion, um, and everyone will have two to three minutes to speak. And I, I think we'll have to play it by ear in terms of whether there are questions that Simon would like to answer immediately when they're raised, or wait until the end. We'll see how that goes. So, um, Lisa, did you want to speak because you raised your hand during the discussion? I mean, during the presentation. 
Oh yeah, I'm I'm sorry for the interruption or uh, for the distraction. I just wanted to say that the Maidan uprising, um, it wasn't just that they beat up the people who were protesting. It was like a mass protest, and I'm sure you know about this, but it was like a mass protest in the middle of Kiev, and the police, without warning, started firing into the crowd and. They have like, in Kiev, they have like pictures and, uh, you know, like quick biographies of the Maidanska Soting, like the Maidan 100 who got killed first and they're considered like national heroes. And it's a pretty like big symbol of their uh, contemporary nationalist movement. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Is it uh, Simon? Simon? Uh, Simon, it's the same as Simon in English. Oh, okay. So okay. you can use Simon as well. Okay. Uh, just, um, it's like ma many issues that Simon was talking about. So I just uh, want to say, because mainly I think we had American audience. Uh, so I know what you have to uh, go through, like, like talking to especially people from the left. So maybe some uh, arguments about uh, that you can use in this discussion, because Simon was talking about the 1998, 1999 um, language law in Ukraine, which was uh, used by Russian propaganda as like a tool that they say um, that the national minorities can't really speak the language now, they, 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 they won't be taught in school and, and so on. And I want to I want to just um, all all of you to look at who was the main um, the, the main countries which were against the, the law. It was Russia and it was Hungary, because uh, when you look at the region of Zakarpatia in, in Ukraine, there's like a large uh, group of Hungarians, uh, which they mostly speak Hungarian language, and they. Uh, used to have like uh, many of them have uh, Hungarian citizenship, citizenship as well, and um, it wasn't um, like even the right wing governments of Poland, Romania, uh, Bulgaria didn't use that issue for for themselves because they mostly know that uh, their minorities speak actually Russian mostly, uh, even in uh, like they they don't speak the the, the languages. And to be honest, it's like saying uh, that the Simon was saying about the Ukrainization process in the in the twenties, and it was actually true that the this language law is not even close to, to what was what was then. And uh, I have to like you can say that all the uh, Eastern European countries have the same problem because like when you look at Poland, which I'm from, uh, you can see like the German minority now. Uh, has, which has their own schools uh, will have less money for the for the schools because of the decision of the government, uh, and like the Lithuanian schools were uh, completely destroyed because of the fact that they didn't get money and it was like schools from the government. It was schools in the in the country countryside, so they were very small schools. So it co completely doesn't exist now. So you can say basically like uh, because I know the situation in Poland very well that the, they destroyed the, the, most of the national minorities' uh, schools. And nobody's saying that, uh, I don't know, Polish, Pol Poland is a fascist government and we need denazification, for example, yeah? So, um, and like uh, the second part is like uh, we, um, at Maidan, the, uh, the extreme right wing uh, was getting popularity. Now it's it's decreasing in Ukraine because they they're not like the Svoboda or uh, right sector, right wing sector are not in, not even in the uh, parliament. And in Poland we have like uh, for example uh, the 11 MPs uh, belonging to the extremely far right party. So Russia can invade us and say we need to then Poland because uh, there is a right wing uh, in the parliament. And it's basically it's uh, and in every. Um, every Eastern European country have uh, extreme right in the parliament. And uh, honestly, in Ukraine, you don't now. now the, 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 the parliament that, that you have in Ukraine now 
doesn't have uh, any extreme right wing party. They're, they're mostly like typically conservative liberal parties in the, in the parliament now. So it makes uh, this um, parallels and like uh, um, claims of, of Russia uh, even, even more weird, uh, especially when it comes from a country where they have a right wing uh, party in the parliament and uh, Dugin as, a, as one of their uh, main ideologues. Uh, that's all for now, maybe, maybe later, because I don't want to, to take too much time for, for, uh, in the discussion. Thank you, Simon. Oh, Virginia, uh, I see your hand, I, and Virginia had put in the chat that some people do not have access to Facebook, and so um, go ahead and post those links, if you must, in the chat box so that people who are not on Facebook can see them. So Virginia, go ahead, and that's the only other hand I see raised for now. Yeah, thanks very much for your talk, uh, Simon. Just um, a, a few points quickly, I hope. Um, when you were talking about uh, Ukrainians working in Europe um, before 2014, um, did they have some sort of uh, associate membership of the EU? But um, certainly they would have been in a disadvantaged position compared to other European countries like Poland, um, who uh, had uh, full access to, to work. Um, and I'd like to know the nature of, of, of the uh, U Ukrainians' income working abroad. Um, were they, on, a, on the whole, on a lower income because of the uh, bureaucratic, um, you know, difficulty in, in finding work because they weren't full memberships or perhaps they were associate members. I don't know. I'd like some clarification on that, if that's possible. And uh, also, um, just about, um, you know, um, those on, on the, many on those, uh, of those on the left in Britain, certainly they will, will bring up uh, Victoria Newland and CIA and, you know, uh, geopolitics and you know, manipulation of Ukraine. And I wonder if you would deal with, with that. And also, um, yeah, um, I, I think that I've, I, um, Volodymyr Ivyshenko, he made some point in one of, one of his papers, I don't remember the detail, that the fact that uh, the right wasn't represented um, in the election, was it 2019, uh, that it's not quite as simple as that. Um, and he was very critical of the right in, um, in Ukraine, I mean, prior to invasion and such, I mean, he had written quite a bit of criticism of, of the right in Ukraine. And um, yeah, there's much other things, as you say, you didn't have time to go into the Russian situation as much as you would have liked. And um, I look forward to hearing more on that at some point. But anyway, those are my three points. Thanks very much. Okay, I've got Ted and then Bradley. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute. <clears throat> well, I thank you, Simon. I think that when you and your conclu concluding remarks, when you talked about the uselessness of nationalism, and I hope that's not paraphrasing you wrongly, but the fact of the right to resist I think that's an important point because <clears throat> for further discussion, because the left, and I mean the genuine left that supports Ukraine's right to resist, needs to develop its program beyond the right of nations to self-determination. And I, I, I just two comments related to this. One is, if you look at the world globally, and the the disaster we face, in, in the many dimensions of the disaster we face with global warming, we don't need separate nations. We need one world government. We need worldwide socialist revolution. But those things don't happen all over the world. There is no international working class movement today. And even if there were, revolutions have never happened globally. They happen country by country. So <clears throat> at the same time, 
the same catastrophes are pushing uh, countries like Russia onto the path of military expansion. And it's not just Russia, I don't think. I think you can see the same thing with China, the rearming of NATO countries like Germany, the attempt to rearm Japan. <clears throat> so the right to resist is really the key point. But OK, the last thing I'll say is I would like to ask Simon this question, because it seems to me that the least patriotic sector of society is the capitalist class, because the capitalist class has become more and more multinational. The Russian oligarchs moved enormous amounts of money out of Russia. I'm sure the Ukrainian oligarchs did the same thing. And in fact, if Putin blows up all the fucking steel mills in, in Ukraine, those oligarchs will probably still have billions of dollars tucked away in the UK. That's the particular question I would like you to address, Simon. The other thing I'm raising is a programmatic discussion for the left, which is to go beyond simply the right of nations to self-determination to the issue of how the right to resist relates to the struggle for international socialist revolution, which we haven't discussed very much. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, Bradley, Linda, and then John. Brad, are you there? Are you unmuting? You yeah. Okay. I did the hand, but not the mute. My okay. apologies. So thanks, Simon, for your thought-provoking um, presentation. I have a kind of quasi-question about the real roots of what I would call the industrial colonization of the Donbass area, which, from what I've seen, based on Wikipedia began in the latter 19th century in a situation where Russian czarism had to import not only foreign capital to industrially to begin the industrial development of Donbass, but it actually had to import foreign capitalists. So that Donetsk, for example, was founded by a Welsh industrial capitalist. His name was John Hughes. And, um, and I, re I bring this up, not just to, to complete the, the picture of the colonization of Ukraine, and especially its industrial capitalist colonization, showing that it began uh, before the Soviet interregnum, but also to point to another issue of contention with our political opponents on the Ukraine question, who some of whom deny that Russia is an imperialist or neo-imperialist power. Okay. Um, old Tsarist Russia was a, you know, a, you could call it a feudal imperial, late feudal imperialist power, but it was also in capitalist terms dependent upon foreign capital investment and the export of capital from uh, Western Europe. Uh, but today's Russia uh, is depicted as essentially a continuation of, of uh, the czarist regime um, because it, it merely exports raw materials. And so it's depicted as a dependent uh, state in the capitalist world system, uh, a sort of semi-colony. But I think what this does, and this is the point I want to make for everybody's benefit, hopefully, is that um, the export of raw materials is an export of capital. Um, petroleum, you know, crude oil, is a commodity. You extract it out of the ground uh, through some industrial production process. 
and then through a commercial circulating process, you send it over outside of your country, you send it to Europe, and they pay money and those revenues go back to Russia into the hands of what we call the oligarchs, perhaps, I guess, uh, or into Putin's pocket himself. Uh, so this is, I think, you know, we call it a traditional Marxist basis for to begin to conceive of contemporary capitalist Russia, which has only become a capitalist state for the first time in its history since the 1990s, by the way, um, for it being a uh, neo-imperialist power in capitalist terms. And that's all I'm gonna say for now. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> I've got Linda, <clears throat> John, and then Lisa again. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, actually, um, I'm wondering what what the um, you know what, what's the um, what would, what's the goal of the of, of Russia and all of this? Because um, well, one question I wanted to was hoping to see have answered was of uh, uh, this presentation was um, what exactly. Uh, what, what, what role did, did all of these appropriations in the 20, in 2014 um, you know play? It seems like um, you know they set up a, a, a few puppet regimes. Um, they um, bamboozled what's left, which isn't really hard to do. And and then all of a sudden they decided that after eight years. So, excuse me. I'm not finished, at, um, people. Um, yeah, so they decided in, after eight years that uh, they've had enough of that and they're just going to go in and take the whole thing. Um, I mean, Russia is kind of what is what I would characterize as a weak imperialist power. They've been trying to, um, uh, you know, assert their 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 position uh, since really Chechnya, and they've also been active in Syria, of course, as we know, and and, and active in in um in African countries too, like Central African Republic and Mali in, in Sudan, or is it or maybe or or is it Somalia? I can't remember which. One. I mean, they've been they've been making a lot of moves towards trying trying to join, you know, trying to create their own imperialist bloc. And it seems like one of, one of the motives they have is to um, renegotiate a sphere of influence with uh, the other imperialists, or, or especially the, the NATO um, and, and, and the US um, block of imperialists. And um, I don't know, I guess I'm just really confused because one of the problems we have in fighting these people in the US that have become you know, mouthpieces for, for the GRU is that, um, is that thing, things seems the, the, the rationale for everything seems to be constantly shifting. Like, they, I mean, these people constantly change their arguments or as to why, um, you know, as to what their political position is re regarding um, the invasion of Ukraine. N none of these shifts ever take into consideration the, the autonomy and, and agency of the, the Ukrainian people, of course, but th th it's still confusing. And, and like, you're constantly answering different, um, you know, you, know are, you, you fight with them over one thing. And then, and then they decide. Well, um, Russia's Russia's not such a great place, but um, it's still up to the U.S. and Ukraine to uh, negotiate. And and they move, they've actually shifted on that. Ukraine is no longer an actor, and it's up to you. The, uh, it's now it's up to the U.S. to negotiate with with Russia, presumably to carve out these spheres of influence that it wants so badly. I just I'm just wondering what, what does Simon think about um, you know what, what is this game all about? And um, why, why did they get? Why did they move from just occupying in the those areas in the Donbass and Crimea, and you know, and, and engaging in a low intensity war with Ukraine? And then why did they shift to that to this all out war? Um, the only the only explanation I've seen that makes any sense is that they were basically being bled dry by this um, struggle in the Donbass, you know, maintaining this um, puppet regime and. And they decided that it's you know they weren't getting enough out of it, so they decided to just take the whole thing. But that's that's my that's my question, and I'm sorry if 
you have trouble understanding it because it's a very it's a very confusing topic. Um, so I'm going to call on Charles next and then Lisa because Charles hasn't spoken and I'm, I'm being a little generous with the speaking time because we don't have a long list of speakers and I think <clears throat> what everyone has to say or ask is, is, is important. So Charles, go ahead and then and then Lisa. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Charles Rackless. I speak on behalf of the International Leninist Trotskyist Tendency Communist Workers Group. Uh, I think the discussion on the, on the national question and uh, permanent revolution is uh, essential uh, because in my understanding, uh, Lenin came around to Trotsky's permanent revolution and understood that the uh, national bourgeoisie uh, in the semi-colonial countries could no longer carry out the tasks of the national democratic revolution. And, and that therefore is necessary to combine the struggle for national liberation with the struggle for socialist revolution. And thus we raise again the position of the Bolsheviks for an independent uh, Soviet uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, for such a, a independent Soviet Ukraine to uh, actually establish uh, the, the internationalist unity it needs to, uh, to win it must also recognize the right for an independent Soviet uh, Donbass and, and Crimea. Uh, then the question is, is also about the, uh, uh, the question of a proxy war, which really wasn't, wasn't raised too much in here, and the role of the West, because much of the left uh, has, has been saying that, well, Ukraine, uh, of course, it does have the right to resist, and we argue for that in our articles, uh, but we, we, we point out that, that, that the Ukrainian bourgeoisie uh, is, is not, a, 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 well, let me backtrack a little bit, but that, that, the, that the struggle for uh, uh, the defeat of the Russian uh, imperialists has to go hand in hand with the struggle against the, the uh, control of, of Ukraine by uh, uh, NATO and that and that uh, uh, semi-colonial countries, dependent countries, cannot be independent of one imperialist bloc or the other, and that because Ukraine today is uh, de a dependent proxy and puppet government of NATO, we have to point our guns as as the international working class, both at uh, uh, NATO and at uh, Russia, and that. Uh, when we talk about the resistance, we have to put that in class terms. We can't just say abstractly that there's a patriotic front uh, of, of all uh, Ukraine uh, that's going to uh, defend and win Ukrainian sovereignty unless we fight for the independence of the working class in Ukraine. And of course, that's the task of the internationalist uh, uh, workers uh, movement to create a workers international. And so we need a new Zimmer wall, the new Zimmer wall that says we turn the uh, inter-imperialist war into a class war. Now, many people will say, and I've heard it on many of these discussions, not with your group, with Tempest and others, et cetera, that this is not a proxy war because there's no Western boots on the ground. But I think that that gives uh, some sort of cover uh, to the arguments of Biden and NATO, et cetera, that, oh, we're not involved, we're just sending, you know, some arms and we're giving a little bit of support and a little bit of intelligence. But I think that the, the, the way that wars are conducted now, the left has to be a little more uh, uh, aware of, of the nature of hybrid wars, of proxy wars, of the ability of the gangster on 12th Street to put the small gangs on 7th Street to war against the, uh, uh, their enemies on 5th Street. In other words, uh, the, the United States, Eastern, uh, Western Europe uh, uh, have, have their intentions uh, to encircle and crush uh, Russia or to at least control it, uh, which um, to us is an inter-imperialist struggle. Uh, and, and that Ukraine has been uh, thrown straight in the middle of that. And, and that uh, even though there's been some discussion of the uh, lesser role of uh, the uh, Nazis uh, that rose up and 
uh, I would disagree and, and say that they were the ones that did the sniping in the, in the Maidan from, from the earlier comment, and I think that's been documented, uh, but, but that, that because the capitalist uh, Ukraine was not able to meet the crisis of the economy uh, that the people faced since restoration, uh, and I think this, this applies across the former Soviet republics, the national question has been reemerged. And because the capitalist, con capitalist uh, governments there cannot meet the people's needs, uh, the, the right wing nationalists have a foot in. And they're able to do that and make their links with the West. And, and therefore, we need to uh, assert the uh, national program of self-determination as linked to permanent revolution. So uh, I'm sure that's my two minutes and, and uh, ho hopefully uh, there's a second round. Thank you. Okay, uh, I've got John, <coughs> Lisa and Stanley. So first of all, I just wanna make a point about Maidan. And you know, I've interviewed about, probably about a dozen people in Ukraine, all more or less on the left. And not a single one of them agrees that the Maidan revolt was a right-wing coup, which is the major claim of the great majority of the Western left. But it's interesting, and it's a really a condemnation of the Western left, of, of that majority, that not a single one of them has actually shown any interest in speaking with or listening to or reading what people in Ukraine have to say. And what would, what would we say to somebody, let's say in Europe, who was gonna write about racism in the United States, but had no interest in hearing from or speaking to or listening to black people here? We would say that they're racist. And I think that that, that would be correct to say that. And <clears throat> um, as far as the uh, uh, NATO expansion, you know, I think that at that time, I'm talking about in the early 2000s, in 1990s and the early 2000s, the main concern of the United States was in, in uh, what they called energy security and combating the fundamentalism and nationalism in the main oil exporting countries and combating uh, um, Islamic fundamentalism. And that had a lot to do with NATO expansion. And in fact, there was a lot of talk, mainly led by Berlusconi, of bringing Russia into NATO. A and Putin was interested in that also, and that he could guarantee energy security for the West. Um, so, but the main point, to, to return to this question of, of paying attention to what people in Ukraine have to say. I mean, I think that that's central and it doesn't mean that we have to agree with people, uh, but you do have to listen to them and think about it and think about the fact that at least in the early days of the Russian invasion in February, they had more people volunteering to join the Ukrainian army than the army could take in. And in fact, there were repeated reports of people trying to bribe the military recruiters to get into the army. So, I mean, you have to start to look at it from that point of view. And in any revolt, especially uh, uh, national movements at this time, one imperialist power or another is going to get involved and try to use it to its advantage. But you can't use that to say, oh, this is just one imperialist power versus another. In other words, this is just a proxy war. You have to look at it from the point of view of the masses of people who are involved in it. And so I think that's, that's um, really has to be our starting point. And as far as, you know, national rights and so on, you know, and the, the whole question of nationalism, you know, this is an issue that it's like the sins of the father shall be visited upon the sons. And if you look all throughout Europe, same in Africa and Asia for that matter, um, when you see different national and ethnic groups spread out 
in, in different parts of uh, European countries. And when you hear talk about, um, about nationalism and so on, you also have to think about the rights of the minorities in those different countries. And this is connected to the whole way that fascists like uh, Alexander Dugan plays up the issue of a multipolar world and, and, uh, and, and so on, which is much too complex of an issue for me to get into, but it's something we have to think about. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna call on Stanley next and then Lisa, because Stanley hasn't spoken yet. <clears throat> and I just wanna make a comment on the time. It's, it's 1020 and I wanna make sure that um, Simon gets to make you know, any follow-up comments at the end when there are still a fair number of people who are here because of course people have to leave and so on and so forth. So um, we'll maybe go on for another 10 minutes with comments and questions and then um, back to, to Simon. Um, Stanley, go ahead. Two questions. Uh, we hear from our left opponents that in 2014, Yanukovych was in office and had been elected in a fair election. So they say what happened in the Maidan was a coup engineered by Victoria Newland uh, for the West. So how would you evaluate the US role in the Maidan during that time? The second question is in the US, our left opponents still predominate on the web and in social media, but when they try to mount demonstrations, they're tiny or insignificant. Uh, what is the situation? like that in Britain. Thank you. Okay, Lisa. I'm just going to be quick because I wanna hear the answers to the questions too that he just asked. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that probably the Maidan uprising was about Ukrainian freedom from Russia's power and I mean from what I understand I don't know enough about it and of course Russian news is trying to frame it as a Nazi um, action which was not the point of it at all the Russian news you know all the mainstream news is straight propaganda they're trying to say that the Ukrainians are all Nazis and um you know, to be sane in Russia right now, you have to just completely ignore everything the mainstream news is saying. Um, I met some Ukrainian nationalists who were very cool and progressive when I was there. And I think it's, a, of course, a bad stereotype that they're all Nazis and propaganda, as I said. And it just happened that the Azov Battalion was the very well-organized like military force at the time of the Maidan uprising and then it got like connected to it. Um, and I'll, I'll let you move on to answer. The question. Oh, and about the, sorry, about the ecological perspective that Russia is helping develop like a global government or something. I don't really think that's their motivation. I think this is Putin's personal like bullying, like even a bunch of people in the Kremlin you know, are suffering from this and would probably stop the war. And that's like one of the big hopes of what would happen to end this war. Probably a lot of his own people are against it by, by now. Um, sadly, a lot of Russians see Ukraine as already being kind of part of Russia. Like they've conquered it before and it's theirs. And this is again, some serious brainwashing that's going on through the media. Um, I would say if any Americans feel like Ukraine is part of Russia and doesn't have a right to resist, they're probably tankies or some kind of weird like meta leftist thinkers and they shouldn't be taken seriously because of course it has a right to resist. Um, they just want their country to be free from this terrible dictatorship, um, you know, from Putin. And it's uh, from an ecological point of view, it's been catastrophic because Ukraine is such a big producer of grain that has fed a lot of countries 
like around the Mediterranean, like North Africa, and there's been massive amounts of grain like stopped in the port in Odessa that have just been rotting. So this is not good for stopping global warming or for anything like that. It's um, it's like producing another catastrophe where people are not getting their daily bread, literally. So, okay, that's it. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'm gonna call on myself. <coughs> and then I think <coughs> since there are no other hands raised um, and we are uh, losing some participants, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, have Simon <coughs> make any, oh, Brad's got his hand raised again. Okay, so Brad, you can come back in after I'm done. Um, I wanna get back to <coughs> Ted's point and Simon's point about, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Just, um, oh. Um, <clears throat> about the, God, just a minute here. <coughs> and the right to resist. Um, <clears throat> and I, I really agree with Ted's point about how um, that needs to be discussed in much more depth as developing a, a program um, for well, an international socialist working class movement because Ukraine is not going to be the end of colonization and war um, by the part of Russia or China or the United States for that matter. But for me, I mean, we can't get around the fact that the, involved in the right to resist is the right to have arms and to defend yourself with a gun. And this is one of the things that I find most I don't know what atrocious about all the calls for peace and negotiations. Again, as John mentioned, it's as if the re Ukrainians have no voice of their own. It's as if they have, I'm sorry, it's very emotional. It's as if they have no right to their own experience. When I think about the weapon of rape in Ukraine right now, which of course has been a time-tested method of war, tactic of war, and the fact that pregnant Ukrainian women are not able to get an abortion in the countries where they've had to flee to for their lives. It's just, it makes me sick. And I often, one of the things that I would say, if I ever have a chance to say it to someone who has that position about peace, oh, peace in Ukraine is, so if you were being raped by a Russian soldier, would you prefer to have a gun to shoot him and stop the rape of perhaps your child? Or would you call for peace, my brother? It's absurd. So in any case, I just wanna make that point that you can both ways, that the right to resist essential means the right to defend yourself with weapons and the right to get those weapons wherever you can get them from. Um, so Brad, I'm gonna um, call on you, but I wanna ask you to, to limit your speaking to uh, two minutes max so that we can have Simon make the, his comments. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Um, the perspective that we that the Russo-Ukraine war is a Zimmerwald is analogous to the Zimmerwald in 1915 and First World War is factually false. And uh, I have no doubt that the NATO powers think they're fighting a proxy war using Ukrainians. That's their point of view, um, but a Marxist point of view, which of course begins with a class analysis, doesn't necessarily just simply end and stop with a class analysis because the Russo-Ukraine war is a war formally between two capitalist powers. One is a non-imperial capitalist power, Ukraine, that has been traditionally oppressed by a neo-imperialist capitalist power, Russia. And that's the present military and war situation. And if there's any doubt that that is not analogous to Zimmerwald and its left in 1915, uh, it needs to contemplate an actual NATO invasion of Ukraine with its full fourth, hundreds of thousands of American, British, Polish, German, French troops 
dress for bear to go to war directly against Russia. That would be analogous to 1915. And obviously that would be immensely qualitatively different from the war that we see at present. Uh, and I'll just end off with a class analysis. Since we're dealing with a war between an oppressed and oppressor nations, both of them capitalist, we have to realize that the form of the conflict um, also involves non-class criteria. So of course we begin with a class analysis, but including that of Russia. But the limits to that involve the actual nature of the conflict as it presents itself to us in reality. So that, I'll just end there. Okay, um, Simon, you are somewhere. I'm oh, I see, I see Charles. Charles, I'm sorry, but I, unless it can be one minute, are you able to just come in for one minute, Charles, wherever you are? Yours? Yes, I can do one minute. Okay, all right. Uh, just, just in this debate, I, I would argue that in this in this war, the uh, inter-imperialist uh, conflict predominates over the national war, and that if uh, the Ukraine working class is going to survive, it has to turn its guns both against Zelensky and against NATO, as well as against uh, uh, Russia. And I think that's a large piece of the debate that we're having on the left. Uh, um, obviously, I'm not talking about with the Putin pals. That's another discussion. Uh, but in, in this side of the left, uh, that's where we have to take the debate. And that, and that means that we need a new Zimmerwald, we need a new international, and we need a program that organizes the Ukrainian working class against the capitalists uh, who are uh, puppets and proxies of, of the West. And that's my minute. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Simon, where are yeah. you? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay, um, great. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll try to be uh, quick. Now, one of um, Stanley's questions was about the situation of, uh, you know, regarding the attitude to the war uh, here in the UK. I mean, I find it quite, I find it quite difficult to judge. I, I agree with you that, um, you know, the internet, which is so positive and important for those of us who believe in human society being a thing, is such a marvelous thing in many ways. It, it can also produce incredibly distorting impressions. And I think actually there is a, um, you know, I think there's an enormous, uh, the, the presence of those uh, Kremlin uh, repeating people is very, very large on the internet. But I think here in the UK, as well as uh, in your experience, it's, it's, it's a bit smaller in uh, real life. I think actually, I mean, I always poo-pooed those who said, oh, you know, Hillary Clinton lost the election to Trump because of Russian bots. I always thought that was nonsense. And uh, I always responded, obviously, you are all in the States or many of you are, and you know much more about this than I do, but I always respond by saying, no, the Democratic Party lost the election because they failed to appeal to black and working class voters uh, and you can't blame it on Russian bots. However, I mean, I do think that Kremlin propaganda is a thing. And I do, and one of the things I want to say in response to this discussion, I mean, you, you know, we have to, there, there are real points of substance and real points of analysis, uh, but also uh, we're conducting a discussion about those under conditions where there's just, and it is very often on the internet, an enormous weight, uh, both of Kremlin propaganda, but also people who repeat it either uh, willingly and knowingly or not willingly uh, and, or not knowingly. Uh, and I think that's a problem we have to live with. The other thing I'd say about uh, the solidarity uh, activity here, and this is a bit of advertising, if you'll excuse me, there, I've put in the chat, that's a link to a thing that I personally have been involved in, which I think is one of the forms of solidarity that can truly be effective, because in the first couple of months, you know, everybody here, lots of people here went on demonstrations. I think ordinary working class people here, by and large, 
very, very sympathetic uh, to Ukraine um, and, uh, you know, ready to take refugees into their homes, all sorts of other measures by which you can see that, just, you know, seeing the reaction to the arrival of refugees here in London um, and, uh, you know, lots of other small things. But when we get past that initial thing, and I think the war is going to drag on, I think that's a very likely scenario. Uh, I've been working with other friends to highlight what's going on in the areas that are occupied by Russia and to try to devise forms of solidarity with the labor movement and with civil society in those areas. What do we do in response to a problem? Of course, we have a Zoom call. And in fact, we had two. We had one last Monday, which was great. We had a representative with a number of human rights organizations. We got a second one on Thursday, which is with the uh, Eastern Human Rights Group, which actually, you know, its title doesn't really describe it fully. It's come out of the workers' movement and uh, was set up by trade union organizers who are from parts of Donetsk and Lugansk, which are actually now they've had to move and, and uh, they come from Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. And they're now based uh, in other parts of Ukraine. Right. Okay. I'll carry on. Um, and yeah, we've got a so we got a call on Thursday. I, I'd invite anybody who's interested to come and listen to what those friends have to say. And we're going to try from that to devise forms of solidarity. Certainly, circulating information will be one thing that we know needs doing about what's going on in the. Russian occupied areas, which I think says a lot about the character of Russian imperialism and the character of the Russian war. And so it's important both from the very practical point of view and also plays into our conversations about um, you know, what, what is Russia doing. But just before I get onto that question, I mean, I do think there are a number of things that have come up here, which I would put under the heading of, you know, things that are, uh, uh, things that are said by the Kremlin and uh, then repeated. And uh, clearly, I'm not accusing anybody here of uh, repeating Kremlin propaganda. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I think there are arguments that, that, that are repeatedly cycled through the left, which are actually very close to uh, the ones that are put by, uh, by the Kremlin and, and clearly have some real significance in reality uh, for that reason, I think the most serious one, and it, you know, it, it's one that I think needs to be argued with, is this issue of uh, is this a proxy war? And clearly, there's a sense, and and I agree with Bradley about this. Clearly, there's a sense in which yes, it's a proxy war. Clearly, there are people sitting in the U.S. State Department. Clearly, there are people in Brussels. Uh, clearly, there are people uh, sitting in uh, Whitehall here in the U.K. Clearly, thinking how they can use this situation to the advantage of the various governments that they, um, uh, th that they belong to. But if uh, we then take that to mean that, uh, that that is the guiding hand to behind the Ukrainian resistance, that's obviously nonsense. I mean, the American position that was put to Zelensky in the first week of the war, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's not only, not only is that position not aligned with the position of working class people in Eastern Ukraine who went out trying to fight tanks with their bare hands, uh, but it's not even aligned with the position of Zelensky. The position of the United, of the US State Department at the start of the war was, hello, we'll offer you um, government in exile. You can come here to the US and uh, beca because we expect that uh, Russia is going to occupy Kiev. And Zelensky's response, we all know, which I mean, I think was quite an important turning point. Uh, no, thanks. Please send me some weapons. Uh, and he stayed where he was. And I think that was, a, you know, to the extent that uh, political actions are important in this thing, I think that was an important one. So there's no alignment between uh, the Ukraine uh, government on this and the um, American State Department. And I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of evidence that before this uh, invasion in February and since, uh, there are, you know, powerful elements in the ruling class of the big Western powers. I mean, I'd say France, Germany, and Italy very openly, uh, but also in the US, I think the ruling class is divided on this. I think they want to uh, 
uh, I think those elements, and I think they're predominant as things stand, would like to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table sooner rather than later. And, you know, the fact that bits of Ukraine are occupied by Russia at that point is, you know, a barrier they're going to try and get over. I mean, at the moment, I don't see any way over it, because I think the level of resistance is in the way that somebody talked about. Uh, and thank you for making this point. Yeah, that I mean, there are more uh, recruits than weapons. Um, and in fact, I had a, some Ukrainian friends visiting who are liberals rather than socialists, or people I know through journalism. And I mean, they were saying they're actually very worried because that what happened was when they ran out of sort of army uniforms and, and the ability to bring people into the army, they, they at a certain point at the beginning of the war, they just started giving everybody guns. And now there are an enormous quantity of guns uh, in private hands uh, in uh, Kiev, this was a reference to Kiev, and, and my friends saw it from their point of view as a, as a big problem. Uh, you know, domestic elements and, and so on are being settled uh, with weapons in hand. Uh, they, we saw this in the Balkans. This is not, a, you know, we are, I think we probably see it in every war. This is not something, in my view, to uh, celebrate or, or whatever. I mean, it's just uh, what happens. Um, but I, yeah, I think the problem with the, the proxy war thing is that it assumes that the agency here, and other people have said this on this call, that the agency is the Western powers and neither the Ukrainian government nor the Ukrainian people, whereas I'd say they are the chief agents who have been resisting uh, this Russian invasion. I, I mean, just very quickly, I've got to come back. I, mean, I, I, I um, uh, Charles said that we have to point our guns at NATO as well as at Russia, I really don't know what you're talking about. And I'm afraid this sort of loose phraseology that we hear in meetings when, I mean, let's face it, we're all sitting, or most people in this call, as far as I can see, are sitting quite comfortably in countries where there's no war going on. I think to talk about which direction we're going to point our guns in, in this conversation is really not helpful. And I'd say it, 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 it reflects the sort of sloganizing uh, that we've all been used to. Uh, I think you've all, I think most people here have spent many years in the movement uh, and uh, that sloganizing, it's not, uh, it doesn't have any meaning uh, in the present situation. And likewise, I'd say to speak about an independent Soviet Donbass and Crimea, when the only versions of Donbass and Crimea that are, that are available are these versions led by Russian government agents and fascist um, gangsters, I would call them in Donetsk and Lugansk. I think that's a fair description, can be borne out by quite a lot of research. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't, it, to my mind, that's empty sloganizing and doesn't mean anything. Um, a, a quick other point uh, raised by Charles, it is not clear who did the sniping on Maidan it just isn't clear. Um, and uh, there's been a huge dispute raging among academics in Canada about this. If you just go to the Twitter feeds of David Marples or Ivan Kachanovsky, they were arguing about it again yesterday. These guys spend their lives reading Ukrainian government documents and, and press much more than I do. It just isn't clear. So let's not say it's clear when it's not clear. Um, it, 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 there were guns all round, obviously, on Maidan, we know that. Um, the, uh, we know that the state forces were under orders to use them and that in many cases they lost their nerve and that was part of the reason that uh, the state ceased to function. Uh, but yeah, um, it, 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 let's be a little less uh, certain where there's clearly uh, uncertainty. Um, okay, so uh, a, a couple of other things in the sort of category of arguments that are thrown up repeatedly by uh, Putinists or um, maybe not Putinists, just kind of people who, you know, long for the Soviet Union even 30 years after it's gone. Um, uh, Stanley, you, you asked, you know, you constantly hear the argument, well, Yanukovych was in office and it was a coup. And what was the role of Victoria Nuland? I mean, I can safely say the role of Victoria Nuland was just zero. Um, the, uh, you know, the conversation which has been made famous via 
Wikimedia is just kind of Wikipedia, uh, what was it called? WikiLeaks, sorry. Um, is just, yeah, I'm sure it happened. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the US State Department who would have loved um, that, that, that there was a right wing coup. But uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it doesn't take an awfully high level of knowledge about what actually happened at the time to see that, you know, it wasn't ordered by Victoria Nuland. I mean, just on a kind of colloquial basis, you know, there were, there were like, there were 200,000 people out on the streets. But what's very important to add is that it was two weeks and it was Ukrainian winter. I mean, it's really cold. It's minus 10, minus 15. You know, we know that we know what CIA inspired plots look like. You know, there are a small number of armed people in a rather chaotic country somewhere, usually in Latin America, right? Who are well motivated, well organized, and you know, they take advantage of the chaos to step in. I mean, it's patently clear that that's not what happened. You know, the 200,000 people out on the streets in the middle of winter and the, the regional uh, demonstration, somebody mentioned Volodymyr Ishenka. I mean, I, I, I blow hot and cold with his, I think his research, his sociological research is very good. I, I am less enthusiastic about his interpretation. He's somebody I've known for a long time. I, uh, we've had our very strong disagreements about the interpretation. Uh, but I mean, one of the things his research showed is the very, very high level of activity, because one of the things, oh, it was all in Kiev. Well, clearly it wasn't all in Kiev. And I think some of Volodymyr's research has shown that very, very clearly. You know, this is a real mass event. Um, so again, it's about, yeah, you know, do Ukrainians have agency? And clearly this kind of Victoria Nuland theory of history is that, you know, they don't. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, you can still read on the internet about how the Russian Revolution of 1917 was cooked up by half a dozen agents of Germany. I mean, you know, let's move on. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Virginia asked about the migrants. The short answer is I, I don't know the details. I know that there was not, um, that there was, that, that they didn't have what they wanted, which was the association agreement with the EU. That was what, the argument was about with uh, Yanukovych. Um, there's very good research on this again, you know, by scholars. Uh, Virginia, if you want to send me an email, I'll, I'll dig it out. There are people who've, who've worked on this. Now, uh, so just very quickly, some of the other questions. I think, I, I, I mean, I totally agree with Cheryl and with Ted, you know, the issue of uh, what does the right to resist mean and how do we theorize in the 21st century the question of national self-determination so on I mean to me it's a question and I'm not I, I'm not going to try and answer it now I think you know because it's uh, I've, I've tried to work it out and been discussing it with friends and comrades and I, I don't have any simple answers to that um, I think I have some answers to Linda's question you know what was what was Russia playing at right what was the aim of this whole thing so firstly, I do not think that there was an economic issue here, neither in 2014 nor in 2022. I do not think that the annexation of Crimea or the, um, uh, or, or the support for the militants in Donbass brought any economic advantage to the Russian Federation. On the contrary, actually, I mean, because I was doing that work for the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, it's a, a job that involved speaking with business people in Ukraine and Russia a lot. And every single one of the Russian business people I was in touch with at that time or had, had a conversation with at some conference or whatever, they hated it because it was clear that they were going to get sanctioned if they uh, went ahead in the way that they did with the annexation of Crimea. And that was a disaster from the point of view of Russian business, right? So there was a real collision between the short-term economic interests of Russian capital, which at that point was to try to, you know, build on the, uh, to start building the recovery from the 0809 financial crisis and get their businesses back operating and get back into some kind of sync with Western business. And the political uh, aims, which were to do with corralling uh, Russians and to do with the fact that I think in the, in the end, you know, the, the, this is another point, the Russian empire cannot live without Ukraine. I think that's uh, 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 politically, 
Um, and that's why we're now, we've had all this stuff about the Russian world and how Ukrainians are really Russians uh, and so on. Um, I think I've answered a lot of the questions. I'll put my email in the chat. I, I, I would plead with you, Cheryl, obviously your choice, but I see that Dennis, uh, who is in or at least from Ukraine, I don't know where he is now, I think he's in Ukraine, but I, I hope you'll let him uh, come in because that would be good. No, absolutely, yes. D um, so uh, Simon, that's not, sorry, sorry. Simon, the other Simon, wanted to say some, I'm not sure, uh, comments but but Dean, yes Dennis, about Dennis, go but ahead Dennis, but maybe Dennis first because he's Ukrainian yes, so I think yes, he yes he's gonna Dennis, have some more interesting stuff than I will okay Dennis wherever you I are I can wait don't worry okay. okay so I'm I'm Dennis Pilash from uh, social movement a socialist group in Ukraine and I am now in Ukraine and I wanted to comment on some of the answers or some of the questions that were put uh, for instance, about um, that uh, Simon uh, mentioned, uh, but hadn't elaborate, um, elaborated about the migrant question. So actually, um, up to this signing of uh, the EU association agreement with uh, uh, by Ukraine, um, Ukrainians had no 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 status in in European countries, and this uh, made their uh, employment uh, much more difficult. So actually, we had millions of people who were forced to to leave the country because there was no job after the industrialization uh, and uh, then the crash collapse. De Dennis, you, you, your your audio is very very yeah. um, weak. Okay. Can you speak directly into your microphone or something so that we can hear yes, you? Yes, yes, I'll try, I'll try. So thank you. Yes, uh, we had millions of people who had to leave the country to work abroad because of the deindustrialization processes and the general economic collapses in the 90s. And uh, I'm uh, from personally from the Carpathia, that was the region that was mentioned by um, Shimon um, uh, that uh, uh, actually uh, not only Hungarians, uh, ethnic Hungarians got Hungarian passports, but also non-Hungarians here, uh, just in order to uh, get legal jobs in the European Union countries. And this is one of the material issues that were uh, driving the people for um, supporting this association agreement with the EU. Uh, but in general, there were also uh, lots of other grievances that um, I would say were very common for all these uh, protests and uprisings um, that we see this uh, wave after the um, 2008 economic crisis throughout the world. The, I think the most iconic were probably the, the Arab Spring, but we, we had different mobilizations throughout the world and Ukraine was no exception. So people were driving by lots of um, social, economic, political issues. And when people just invoke Victoria Nuland to explain what happened in Ukraine, uh, well, it's 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 so lame because actually uh, you should uh, know none of these people um, know, uh, for instance, the name of Ihar Indila, who was a student who was killed in a uh, police um, department, or the name of the village Vradivka, where uh, um, bunch of men including a policeman uh, raped and killed the women and this uh, all all this added to for instance a general mood against the police violence here and so that dispersal of uh, first maidan protest the so called student protest uh, that was the last drop and it was so so powerful this um, reaction from the people precisely because the issue of police violence was and in many cases still is very pressuring in, in Ukraine. And uh, um, then we had the 16th January laws that effectively outlawed any kind of independent activity, including that on behalf of um, grassroots organizations and unions. Uh, and it was the, the way, paving the way to something like uh, Lukashenko's um, authoritarian regime in, in Belarus. And in some way, it was a point of no return that forced many people, including on the left, to, to support the protest because uh, there was no other option. The other option was becoming a, a Russia-controlled, very authoritarian state. 
And we can see that, that Russian imperialism, uh, it really acts as some kind of new uh, gendarme of, of Europe. Uh, not, not, not so much of Europe, but as a post communist state. And um, uh, actually suppressing uh, protests, popular protests in Belarus and Kazakhstan, but also beyond. And uh, supporting lots of um, authoritarian regimes like the, the Myanmar uh, dictatorship, butchering thousand people. Uh, even um, the most recent example, uh, the Rajapaksa clan in, in Sri Lanka, there were two institutions they, they were turning for financial and political support recently, and that, that was the IMF and Russia. So uh, Russian imperialism is uh, a, a, an, an agent on its own, and it's uh, just, just as bad as any other imperialist. So um, it's, it's really for many people, um, the Western left, they are really trapped into this uh, America-centric um, kind of worldview that uh, denies the existence of any other imperialisms um, or seems uh, or sees them as something that is like a counterweight to, to their own and so it's the lesser evil. But actually it's a continuation and uh, it's, it's quite important to be consistent and to be against all imperial aggressions, be it Russia in Ukraine or Erdogan against the, the Kurds or Saudi Arabia. Now I, uh, I think Biden is coming to Saudi Arabia. So it's a very legitimate um, uh, way to protest the American imperialism. Uh, but uh, just to con consent to uh, reduce uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine to some kind of proxy war, it's like calling the Vietnam War a, it was a proxy war of the uh, US against uh, China and uh, the, the USSR. And uh, just denying that that was the war of extermination of Vietnamese people by the uh, US imperialism. And uh, this is the same situation because it's an existential threat for Ukrainian working class and Ukrainian people in general. The Russian uh, occupation and the Russian warfare, it means in many cases, the physical destruction of, of the people. And uh, then the occupation means also no way to provide any kind of legal um, activity. So uh, Simon knows a lot about uh, what was the situation with the um, unions in the Russia controlled uh, parts of Donbass or, and in general of some kind of independent entities. They were all crushed, suppressed, and there is no room for, for uh, their existence. So this is really an issue that is um, that people here are forced to resist because there is also no other option. So that's, that's why it's so important to have uh, an understanding and to have a solidarity because um, actually all, all the struggles we are facing here, they, are, uh, they go beyond the, um, just the Ukrainian context. And um, in order to have a, a world as it will be more equal, more free, more solidary, um, more just, uh, we cannot uh, just turn a blind eye to um, other imperialism's wrongdoings. So it, it has to be resisted as, as well as, as your own. Thanks. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much for those comments, Den Denise. Um, Simon, um, the other Simon from Simon M. Would you like yeah. to? So, so we're going to wrap up. Here. Uh, yeah. Gonna, you go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Very briefly, a uh, few technicalists, because one uh, about uh, the things uh, Simon is saying about. Because in the, when uh, he was talking first, he was saying about the uh, like the other struggles as well, uh, like Palestinian and all. Uh, I'll send the link of uh, Congress of the Polish uh, Left Wing Party Razem, which they had uh, organized a panel uh, with uh, Ukrainians, but also uh, Palestinians from the BDS movement and uh, Kurdish Turkish HDP party. So. Uh, the, I will show you the ways how they link the struggles together. That's the first thing. And the second one is about your intervention in the discussion, because you said about the about uh, the rape. It's uh, it's a very good point. 
and uh, in the uh, European network uh, of solidarity with Ukraine, we have uh, two manifestos about uh, the situation. One, one is organized by, I send the links as well, one, one by the Ukrainian feminists with the help of ENSU uh, about the self-determination and the um, right to struggle, the military struggle. Uh, so uh, I'll send the links and if any of you want to sign or uh, give it to other feminist organization or, or, uh, or any groups who would uh, willing to sign in the US, uh, that will be good. And the second one is about the abortion rights in uh, especially uh, it consists the ones in Poland because uh, as many of you may know, uh, in Poland uh, abortion is very restricted and we have uh, the biggest groups of migrants of uh, of uh, refugees ukrainian women which have like uh, in the peak uh, time it was about three million people now it's less because some of them are uh, in other european countries some came back to ukraine but still it's over like maybe two million people uh, mostly women so um, and the problem of abortion is really big and the organization called abortia bez granis abortion without borders uh, just got uh, financial help from the French government recently uh, just for um, organizing abortions abroad or, or the um, pharmacol pharmacological abortions for Ukrainian uh, women. So uh, I'll send the links for both of the um, manifestos. So if any, uh, any of you want to sign or, or any organization you know which one is signed, we'll be very grateful for that. And there was uh, the question from Virginia about the migrants, and uh, Dennis partial, uh, partially talked about it, but I would say from the Polish perspective, there was like, uh, even if I've, um, just about um, 214, 215, there was about thousands of Ukrainians uh, working in Poland. And um, even before the war, it was about one, million uh, one million uh, workers in Poland Ukrainian workers so you have to see um, that um, and Poland was not not the only country which Ukrainians came uh, you talk about Spain but uh, the big uh, the country with big uh, Ukrainian uh, migrant and workers community is uh, Portugal uh, which not any everyone knows and there's also Germany so there was uh, even if they didn't have the abilities like uh, um, being the part of the EU. Uh, there was uh, like, for example, in Poland, they had, uh, um, they were able to work thanks to the um, agreement between Poland and Ukraine. So it was like a country to country agreement, not, not the, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with EU at that point. Uh, so that's about the migrants uh, situation. Mm, I think that's that's about it for now. Maybe I'll think about something later. Okay. <clears throat> well, so um, it's been a great discussion. I mean, from my point of view, I really appreciate all the comments and the questions. Um, so John had posted his email address in the chat. Um, if you would like to sign up for our email list for the Ukraine Socialist Solidarity Campaign email list.